Thank you for joining us today here at Avalon Church. It's so good to see your beautiful face. Those of you that are live and in person here, and those of you that are joining us online, we're so very happy that you're part of Avalon Church as well. As we say every week, we are one church in many locations, and we're so thrilled that you've joined us today. And we believe that God has some great things for us today. We're going to learn some things from the Word of God that I believe will be a very big help to you. And then, of course, next week, we're going to wrap up this series on questions, and I'm going to be talking about the question of discouragement. We face discouraging times all the time in our life. We face it in our world right now. And so don't miss that next week. If you're joining us online, invite somebody to watch with you. If you're joining us in person, invite somebody to come with you, and I think it'll be a real blessing to you. Well, before I get started in the message today, I think I need to address what's going on in our nation. Uh, recently, Ahmad Arbery and George Floyd uh, were both killed, murdered um, in just an unbelievable, despicable kind of way. And as a, as a leader, I don't have any control over this, but what I can say is this must stop. This kind of thing must stop. It is not only wrong, but it tears apart people. It tears apart families. It tears apart our nation. Now, I must say this. I, I support protest, but I don't support violence. I don't support burning buildings and overturning cars. I believe that Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela may be two of the greatest figures in history to teach us how to deal with things and to affect change in a peaceful way. And I believe that their examples are very important for people right now. But I, I must say that there's a couple things that we must do. First of all, we must recognize as a church the sinfulness of not only murder, but of racism. Let me give you just a, a few reasons from the Bible why that is wrong. Um, number one, we're all made in the image of God. The Bible tells us that we are image bearers, the imago Dei. God has made us in his own image. And whenever a person says, well, this group of people is superior, or I am superior to this group, you're guilty of idolatry. One of the worst sins in the Bible, the, the sin of idolatry. So how is that? Because you are worshiping self over creation, over the creator rather. And, and whenever I do that, I'm guilty of idolatry and guilty of rebellion against God. So that's one reason. Number two, um, every one of us came from Adam and Eve. We have the same parents. And so we obviously need to love one another. And I think a very important reason is that Christ died for all. You've never locked eyes with another person on this planet that God did not love and that Jesus Christ did not die for. And that is a sobering thought. And, and you know, the fact is when we see things like this in the news, uh, for some, it's there for a minute and then it's gone. But the fact is when you and I begin to get very serious and think very deeply about why God has us here, our purpose in life, what Jesus has as a mission for the world, then we see that these kinds of things not only are distracting, but they destroy things. And they don't come from God. God forbid that anybody ever thinks that. The fact is they come from the evil one. They come from the devil. The Bible says that he is a liar and he's the father of lies and that he is a murderer from the beginning. So we have to recognize that for what it is. Uh, I believe also all are important to God. Every person is important to God. You may not be famous or powerful or wealthy, but every person is important to God. And then I believe that we are all one in Christ. This is the beautiful thing about the church. The Bible tells us, and the Apostle Paul wrote this, he said, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, so there were divisions from religion. There's neither male nor female in that culture. 
uh, women were considered property. And so he was saying there is no difference there. And there is neither bond nor free. And, And what he was saying was this. We all are equal at the foot of the cross. We all are equal in God's eyes. Now, the fact is, not everybody has the same amount of talent. We understand that. But that has nothing to do with equality. That has nothing to do with being one in Christ Jesus and in the church. And then I believe one of the most important reasons why we must do something about this, particularly in your own life, is that racism guts the gospel. I mean, the very essence of the gospel is that I can't, but God can. I cannot do this on my own, but God enables through the power of Jesus Christ for me, not in my own effort, not in my own goodness, but he enables me and empowers me to come to Jesus Christ. And so um, you and I must be aware of that. So what do we do? In a time this, like this, what do we do? It's frustrating. It can be discouraging. For many, many, uh, it goes well beyond that. And the fact is, Um, sometimes for people, when they are dealing with this, it is emotional rather than logical. And anytime you're dealing with someone's emotions, you can spew out all the logical facts that you want and often doesn't make a difference because when you're emotional about something, you know, you're not really into the facts or to logic. So I believe there are four things that we must do as a church, four things we must do as believers. Number one, we must pray. He said, well, that's not that important. Actually, it's the most important thing we can do. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for healing in our nation. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. The fact is, anytime this kind of thing goes on, it's despicable and wrong. But the fact is, we can pray, and we can pray not only for those involved, Not only for the victims and their families, but also for the police officers. I realize that there are some police officers that um, have done things that uh, dishonor the badge and are just simply wrong, okay? But the truth of the matter is the majority of police officers are there for our protection. They are wonderful people. They every day sacrifice and put themselves in danger for our safety. Now, what you and I must learn to do in prayer, praying for people, is we've got to learn that, uh, you know, just because one person may do something bad doesn't taint everything else. For example, if you went to a restaurant and you had a bad experience, you might say, I'm not going to go to that restaurant again. What you would not say is, I'm never going to eat food again because I had a bad experience at that restaurant. Well, of course you would not say that. And in the same way, As believers in Christ, we must pray. We pray for the victims of this violence and this racism and the victims and their families, but we also pray for the uh, police officers and their families because many of them are facing uh, very difficult times. Can you imagine trying to do a job that you love, trying to do a job that in your heart you're just there for people, you're trying to help people? Can you imagine trying to do that in this environment? And on the other hand, we also must be aware of the emotions and what's going on in our culture. So we must pray. Number two, we must listen. And I think this is one of the most important things because for all of us, we have a perspective on life. Um, Your perspective may be different than mine because of your background, how you were raised. But here's what the Bible teaches us about this, that we are to consider others more important than ourselves. We are to put others' needs before our own. We are to serve one another. That is constantly taught throughout the New Testament. So if you want to learn what to do, and I realize that for many, there's, you feel like there's really nothing you can do other than get upset at the news or get frustrated and turn it off or stop talking about it. But God says we must put others' needs ahead of our own. So we pray and we listen. We listen. And, and listening You have to actually open your ears. And listening sometimes has to be done in a way that you may not agree with what's being said. And and that's okay. 
all right? Because Christians are to bear one another's burdens. And then the third thing I think we must do is be the church. Be the church. It is during times like this that as believers, we are able to live out the gospel. We are able to reach out to people. We are able to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Here's the thing. Jesus and the gospel is the hope of the world, not the government. Now, thank God for government. It's ordained by God. But the fact is, the government is not where your hope is or where my hope is. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this. The only hope, the only hope for resolving these issues in our nation and across the world is Jesus and the gospel. Because we can come up with policies till we're blue in the face. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face. We can watch news until we're blue in the face. But Jesus and the gospel is the hope of the world and of our culture and the hope for our time. And then here's the final thing I think we need to do as a church. We need to use wisdom. Use wisdom. Filter what you put in. Because the fact is, I... I've heard some of the most incredible nonsense uh, in the past couple of weeks that I've ever heard in my life. I read where one mayor said, uh, he was looking at this and he said, hey, no big deal, talking about the George Floyd. I'm like, no big deal? Are you out of your mind? What is, how can a person say something like that? Then on the other hand, I heard a woman uh, talking about that there is a, there is a nationwide secret conspiracy from all white people to kill all black people. And I'm like, you know what? I know that's not true. And so my point is this. Use wisdom. Use wisdom. The fact is, you need to, you need to stay up on the news. I encourage you to do that. But don't, don't wallow in it. The more you watch that, you're either going to get depressed or discouraged or angry, disgusted, or whatever. And so the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, we have a responsibility as a church. Now, I do not believe the Bible tells us that we are to be uniform, but we are to have unity. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. Uniformity means everybody looks the same, dresses the same, acts the same has the same beliefs, everybody has all their choices made for them. It's all about uniformity, looking like everybody else, being like everybody else, and nowhere is that taught in Scripture. And you can just look in nature and see how diverse and beautiful God's creation is. It's fantastic. I mean, the fact is God created 300,000 species of beetles, for goodness sake. I mean, he is a creative and loving God. Um, but unity is where you unify around a cause. Unity is where you have the same direction, the same, you're pointing in the same way. And what is beautiful about Christianity is this. God sees all people as the same. He sees all people as in need of Jesus Christ, and we can get behind the fact that Jesus is the hope of the world. He's the hope of the world. Amen, church. Amen. Can we say amen there? The fact is, I believe God has called us to that. I want to pray, and then um, I've only got about 16 minutes left. All right, so, uh, but I think it was important for us to say today. Heavenly Father, I pray for our nation, for our people. Lord, I know that there are so many that are hurting. There are so many that have questions, and there are so many that are disgusted. And, and well, they should be. Lord, I pray that you'd bring peace and racial harmony. God, I pray that you would protect victims and their families. Lord, I I pray for our police officers. Lord, what what an incredibly impossible job to do. God, I pray for uh, our churches that we would stand up and that we would speak out and that we would do what we can do to be the church. Father, we want you to know that we love you today and we praise you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I want to talk to you about the question of faith. We've been talking about questions, and we're going to read a passage from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet, and um, so 
I'm not going to go into all the background details that I was going to talk about. But the fact is, God asks Jeremiah a question. And you need to understand that Jeremiah was a prophet uh, to the land of Judah, the southern uh, kingdom of Israel. And it was during the time of Babylonian captivity. And God appeared, spoke to Jeremiah, possibly through a dream, through a vision. We're not sure exactly how. But here's what God told Jeremiah to do. He said, I want you to purchase some property, go buy it, and I am going to deliver this entire nation into the hands of Babylon. Now, let me just say this. If I know that a country is getting ready to be taken over, I'm not investing in a vacation home, okay? I'm not buying property because I know that the money that I put into that is immediately when that uh, nation overpowers that my nation or where I live, I'm going to lose every bit of it. But here's what God was teaching Jeremiah, and I believe what he's teaching us, <clears throat> that it is a question of faith. God did this to demonstrate his power. God did this for Jeremiah to demonstrate how much he loves us. He did this to demonstrate that we can trust him. You see, it was a great act of faith on Jeremiah's part to say, you know what, God, I'm going to obey you and I'm going to take my money and I'm going to buy this property. And then what you are going to do is I'm eventually going to get it back because you are going to restore us back uh, to your promises. So we're going to pick up in Jeremiah chapter 32, and I'm going to read about 15 or 16 verses and the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And that's our big question today. Is anything too hard for God? Man, what a broad subject. I could talk about that forever and ever. Is there anything too hard for God? I think the answer is no. There is nothing that's too hard for God. And obviously we understand that you ask questions that are logical and I've heard people say, can God create a rock that's too big for him to pick up? Well, that's a dumb question. Okay, I'm sorry. But, you know, some people say there are no dumb questions. That's a dumb one, all right, because that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, you can't use a self-defeating question. Like, for example, I have some young friends that have come to the conclusion and they've made this statement, there is no absolute truth. And I ask them, is that an absolutely true statement? <laughs> because if it's true, it can't possibly be true. Do you see what I'm saying? You can't use a self-defeating question about God. So if you ask God, or if you ask about God, well, can God sin? No, he cannot sin. You say, well, then uh, there's something he can't do. Yes, he can't do this. And here's the reason. Uh, God is holy and righteous. He is, the, he is the personification. He is the standard, the measure of all that's right and wrong. It is from God that we get the idea that there is moral and that there is good and that, you know, there's right and wrong. And without that standard, you don't have that. And so if God were to sin, he would no longer be God. He would no longer be that standard. So God cannot sin. So he says, is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. He said, behold, I'm giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Chaldeans, some translations use that. It just means the Babylonians. And the Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall come and set this city on fire and burn it with the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal. And you all understand <clears throat> what God here is doing is he's announcing the judgment after hundreds and hundreds of years of Israel rejecting him and not only just living in sin and idolatry, they were literally, they had come to the point that they were so far from God and they were so wicked, they were literally sacrificing their children, burning them alive to Molech. Now, I don't know how you feel, but any nation, any group of people, any person that will burn a baby alive deserves judgment. They deserve retribution. Can I get an amen? I mean, everybody here knows that. So don't, don't get this picture that God is some giant ogre in the sky. Uh, the fact is we often uh, associate the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, 
as the angry God. But when you read in context, it, normally it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and thousands of chances. He is a God whose mercy endures forever. And whenever we see where God actually does judge, it is well deserved, okay? So what he's doing is he's describing the judgment and then he's gonna describe how he's gonna forgive and restore and heal. Okay, so let's continue to read. He said, the children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. This city has aroused my anger and wrath and from the day it was built to this day. So I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger. Their kings and their officials and their priests and their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. By the way, they were setting up idols to worship in the temple and the places of worship. And not only that, they had with the, the, uh, the false god Baal uh, was a fertility god. It had gotten so bad that they literally had temple prostitutes, listen, prostitutes, when someone would come supposedly to worship God, they could get a prostitute and have sex, male or female, before they went in supposedly to worship. Now, obviously, these people had turned from God. Um, they built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to uh, offer up their sons and their daughters to Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Now, here's where you see the mercy that is everlasting from God Almighty. Thank God for it. He says, yes, for years and years and years, they've rejected me. They've done all manner of evil that deserves my judgment, and I'm going to judge. But this is where you get the picture of the gospel, how that Jesus took our punishment. He became our sin. He died a death that we deserve to die to give us a life that we never deserved. Notice what God says. He promises it is given into the hand of the king. He says, behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation, and I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not return or turn from me. And I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and soul. I know a lot of times if you're like I am, I don't like reading judgment passages. It's kind of a downer. But oh, I love this because God shows that yes, there is a consequence to sin, but his mercy endures forever. And that through Jesus Christ, we do not receive the judgment of God. We receive the grace of God. Thank God because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And we can live in this state of forgiveness and peace and joy because of what Jesus has done for us. Well, God says to Jeremiah, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Of course, the answer is no. From this text, let me give you three thoughts, and I won't be very long. Three thoughts from this text that show us three things that are not too hard for God. Number one, it is nothing is too hard for God to forgive. No matter what it is, nothing is too hard for God to forgive. Can I get an amen there, church? The fact is, God Almighty loves us. There is no sin. There is no past. There is no problem from your past that God is unable to handle because he is a God who forgives. When we turn to him, he will 
cleanse you from your past. He will purge you from your secret sin. And no matter how many times you've rejected God in the past, the truth of the matter is God loves you. And if you'll turn to him, he'll receive you just like you are. Like Billy Graham in his revival crusades, he would always sing at the end of the sermon, just as I am. And people would come by the hundreds and by the thousands and give their lives to Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's how God is calling you just as you are. The fact is there is no sin that's too hard for God to forgive. I have an uncle that died at age 50 and um, his name was Tom and he's my mom's youngest brother. And even though Tom was raised in a Christian home, Christian family, he didn't get saved. He rejected Christ. As a teenager, he began to live a a drug lifestyle and that kind of thing. And for years and years and years, he lived that. And we prayed for him and prayed for him and prayed for him. And yet it seemed like he never would receive Christ. One night, he had taken a drug overdose. And he was aware and able to talk. But the doctors gave him, I want you to get this, less than a 5% chance to live to the next morning. And my mom, his older sister, and my dad were in that room with him and praying with him. And they said, Tom, don't you want to receive Christ tonight? The doctors have said that you only have a 5% chance to live till the morning. He looked at them. He said, no, I believe I'll wait. What a, what a tragic thing. But you know what happened later after years and years of continuing to pray for him? Probably 15 years after that, Tom, as a man in his 40s, he opened his heart and life to Jesus Christ, and he gave his heart to Christ. And before he died, he knew that he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, what am I saying? There is no sin too hard to forgive. God will not give up if you won't give up. And I want to just challenge you with your relatives and with those that you're praying for, with your loved ones, don't ever, ever give up because nothing is too hard for God. Amen? Nothing is too hard for God. Here's the second thing. No one is too hard for God to reach. No one is too hard for God to reach. I love the fact that in this text that we read, there were people that, had worshiped Molech and Baal, and yet God was willing to reach them. A number of years ago, my wife and I met a pastor in Hawaii. I know it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? So we were there for this pastor's conference. You know, if I have a choice between going to a pastor's conference in Hawaii or in Columbia, South Carolina, guess which one I'm going to choose, all right? So well, anyway, we were there. We met this guy. His incredible story, he was, um, he, as a young man, he murdered a man in cold blood. He had been given life without the possibility of parole. It was, they said, hopeless for this man. Well, to make a long story short, in prison, he actually gave his life to Jesus Christ. And I know there's probably a lot of prison conversions when people are in trouble. And then when they get out, they don't really follow up with it. But this man did. I mean, he truly gave his life to Christ, and God began to change him, even there in prison. And he began to minister to people, and he began to help people, and he won inmates to Christ. And for years, he began to make an incredible difference in the, the, the people, the guards, and the warden. And everybody knew that this man had been completely changed. And as a story that only God can do, the family of the victim that this man killed. They were believers. They were Christians. And they began to notice the change in this man. And they began to pray for him. And they eventually went and began to petition for the governor to uh, set him free. And that's exactly what he did. And this man, to this day, as far as I know, is still serving in a church in Hawaii, reaching people for Jesus Christ. What am I saying? There is nobody that's too hard for God to reach. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. And then the last thing, there is nothing that God cannot restore. Nothing. God talked about the judgment that he was bringing on Judah and Israel. 
But in the end, he said, I'm going to restore you back. I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, God has the power to redeem because of Jesus. And he can restore you. He can redeem you. He can redeem you from your past. He can redeem you from the sins that you've lived in and committed. He can restore that broken relationship. He can restore your health. He can restore you financially. And here's the point. When I begin to live for God and I begin to truly believe by faith that God is the one that loves me and God is the one that is in control, then I begin to believe that nothing is too hard for God. There is no sin that I've ever committed that he is incapable of forgiving if I'll turn to him in faith. There is no person that's too far from him or too hard for him to reach. And there is nothing in my life that God does not have the power to restore. He can restore you. He can restore your health. He can restore the time. I don't mean that he can, you can go back and relive the past, but I do know this, he can redeem the time and what time you have left. He can make it powerful and impactful because there is nothing that is too hard for God to restore And the reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, is we saw the shadows of this in the text that we read in the Old Testament, that one day the Son of God left heaven and he became human so that he could live a life that we could not live. He lived a perfect life for us and he died on a cross to redeem us and to save us from our sins. Jesus, here's what he said. One of the favorite things about him, and there are a lot of things to like about Jesus. <laughs> but he said, I came to save sinners. I came to save sinners. And I want you to know something. If you've ever told a white lie, if you've ever had a bad thought, if you ever were selfish at one point in your life, maybe you're a pretty moral person, but you've had those sins. You've all obviously told a lie. You've obviously done something wrong, whether you're that person or whether you are the person that has murdered someone, there is nothing that is too hard for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to forgive. And He can restore your purpose. He can restore your life. He can restore your passion if you'll come to Him because of the gospel. Amen, church. Amen. Thank God that Jesus Christ is the reason for our hope. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us today. Help us to trust you. Help us to live for you. God, I pray for those here today that have loved ones that are far from you. Give them hope. Don't ever let them give up. Don't ever let them stop praying and believing. God, I pray that you'd save and restore. Lord, for those that are believers, but they've been broken by, we could call it bad choices. But Lord, let's just say what it is, it's sin. The things they've done that were wrong. Lord, let them know that you can restore. There is nothing, there is nothing that you have not forgiven in their lives as they're a follower of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help them to realize that there's nothing they've ever done that is too hard for God to forgive or nothing that has ever happened that is too hard for God to restore in their life. I pray that you'd restore marriages. I pray that you'd restore hope. I pray that you'd restore passion. I pray that you'd restore uh, the, the, the purpose of people's lives. I pray that you'd restore them in their health and their finances, Lord. And in all these areas, God, restore them because of your grace and your mercy. And then, Lord, I pray for those that need to take personally this message that there is nothing too hard for you to forgive and there is no one that's too hard for you to reach and I pray that right now they would give their life to Jesus Christ before I finish my prayer I wonder if I can pray for you whether you're live in the room or whether you're joining us online I wonder today if you would say pastor I need Jesus don't know what your past is like God does he says he'll put it under the blood of Jesus Christ if you'll turn to him 
He promises He will save you. So one prayer, God always answers. So why don't you say something like this in your heart or you can say it out loud if you're watching at home. You can say it in your mind. But something like this, Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and I believe that you died for my sins and that you resurrected from the grave. And I'm asking you right now to come into my life and to save me, to change me. And I'm giving you my life. I'm committing myself to you. God, I'm not perfect. I can't do this on my own. And so I'm asking for your help. You prayed a prayer like that today. I wonder if you're watching online. Would you click there in the description that you prayed to receive Christ? It'll say, I, I raised my hand to receive Christ. We had people do that last week, and I hope you'll do that right now. For those of you live in the room, you'd say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you today. I want you to know about it. Anybody in here like that, would you raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see so that I could uh, pray for you? Wherever you're joining us from, I hope that if you made your commitment to Christ today, that you'll let us know. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all. Lord, those that are praying for loved ones that need to be reached, those that are praying for family members. God, I pray that you just answer their prayers. God, I pray that you'd restore. I pray that you'd save. I pray that you'd forgive. And we want you to know today that we love you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. 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 Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. And a couple things you can do. If you'd like to take your next step online, make sure that you fill out the next step card. It's very important that you do that. So I want to encourage you to do that. Click on the description there, fill out the next step card. If you're new to Avalon Church, I want you to fill out a next step card today and then you can drop it in the bucket on the way out. And uh, that way we'll have a record of your visit and we'll help you with your next step. All right. And maybe your next step is baptism and you're going to get signed up for the next baptism. Maybe your next step is the next step class, and you're going to take the next one that we have available. Um, whatever your next step is, I would encourage you to do that. And I want to thank you. And then I know that for everyone, everyone, a next step is to invite somebody. We say here at Avalon Church, inviting is evangelism. I want you to invite somebody to come with you next week. Isn't it good to see people coming back to church live? Oh, so I love this so much. So beautiful. And uh, we want more and more people to be able to join us every week. And so invite someone, invite someone. And then maybe uh, you'd invite someone to watch with you online as well. And so I would encourage you to do that. Last thing, and we're done. If you'd like to give in our offering today, and I want to say publicly, thank you for giving. Thank you for following Jesus. The maturity that so many of you have shown in your faith has been just astounding and amazing to me. Without you, the church wouldn't be able to exist. And yet, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of everyone not being able to get out, not only have we survived, we've been thriving, okay? And so thank you for your faithfulness to give. You can give one of four ways if you're here in the, uh, in the service. You can give in the bucket on the way out, drop it in. You can give at the giving kiosk. And then, of course, you can give online, both uh, those of you watching online and those of you here in person, you can give online at avalonchurch.net forward slash give, or you can text 84321, 84321. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in that. Let's everybody stand together. Thank you for joining us today. It's so great to see you all. I want you to know that I love you. And for those of you joining us online, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to be able to see your lovely face very soon. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.